Hey everyone, we're back and we're going to continue along the lines that we've been looking. We've been in a lengthy study of Romans chapter 2 and um, we've taken a little bit of a side journey, a rabbit trail if you will, which I failed to complete last video. So we're going to pick that up this time over in Galatians chapter 5. Uh, hopefully conclude that today so we can jump back into Romans chapter 2, finish that up, and eventually get into the book of the Revelation. And um, it's kind of comical right now how much stuff that my wife and I keep seeing about the book of the Revelation and the, the phrase apocalypse or apocalyptic. And the sad thing is, is I don't think in the last several months when I've even heard reference to the book of the Revelation or the apocalypse or something that's apocalyptic, it, ever, it never actually, not once, has ever meant <laughs> what the word actually means. So it's usually some catastrophic end of the world, catastrophic end of the planet. And, um, you know, there's just certain points in time where you get pushed to a point where your brain can't take it anymore and you think you're in an asylum and you have to say something. So um, I think the timing of it is quite amusing, but um, I have wanted to get into the book of the Revelation for a little while. So um, I want to finish up this rabbit trail though in Galatians chapter five. So if you turn over there with me, I had opened my big mouth a few videos ago and I made the statement about the fact that this infamous or notorious beast that's mentioned in the book of the Revelation is not actually a one world government ruler as Christian tradition insists. Uh, this strikes much more uh, closely to home and really hits us where we live in everyday life and we just haven't really been aware of what's been staring at us right in our faces. So um, Galatians chapter 5 Let's, along that line, continue about what is this actual beast. And in the book of the Revelation, uh, the 13th chapter, uh, John sees uh, a really graphic depiction of this beast and how it rises within the world and also how it manifests through the harlot church. Because in the book of the Revelation, if you remember, um, the harlot church, whose name is Babylon, she's actually depicted as the true false prophet because she has been. And in that Revelation, that, that 13th chapter of the Revelation, John not only describes in, in vivid detail how that beast manifests through the world, but also how that beast manifests through the church and how the manifestation of the beast through the church has actually led to so much of, I should say most of, the world's problems and dilemmas. Uh, the reason why the world has been so mixed up and confused about a great many things has been because the harlot church is full of mixture and confusion. That's why her name is given to be Babylon. And so, um, but we will get into that. Um, but for now, Galatians chapter 5, um, Paul says in verse 9, um, he writes to the Galatians and he says, A little leaven leavens the whole lump. And uh, we talked about this in regard to the law. The law is that leaven, and it's just, just a little bit of it. I mean, it doesn't take a lot, um, a lot of yeast to make the dough rise. It doesn't take a lot of the law to puff up people and make them arrogant. In fact, you can, you can actually <laughs> get quite puffed up and arrogant based upon your thinking that because you keep so much as one commandment in the law, you observe one commandment based on the dead letter of Scripture, and you can think that because you keep that one thing that's written in the Bible, um, that you now have the power to make and keep yourself right with God on the basis of your performance or obedience of that one thing. And in all honesty, that's how, you know, most all denominations have arisen. Um, each denomination has 
a little part here and there of the scripture that they focus upon, that they major upon, and they base their entire belief system around just some <laughs> vague interpretation, man's interpretation of the dead letter of scripture. And I mean, they have they have built movements out of this thing. They have uh, this sort of thing. They have built buildings. They have created mass wide scale followings just on focusing on one, on one or two parts of the law or the dead letter of scripture and, and thinking that by their observation of those things that their, their performance of those things, their obedience to those things make and keep them right with God. And they think that it's the gospel because it's based on scripture, but it's not the gospel. Um, so a little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump. Just a little bit of law added back on top of grace, of course, is mixture, confusion. That's where the harlot church in the book of the Revelation gets her name Babylon. But just a little bit of law can really puff up people and make them very arrogant in their thinking. Um, so remember in James chapter 2, James wrote and he said that, you know, in order, to, in order to keep the law, you've got to do the whole thing. And if you so much as break one part of the law, you've broken the whole thing. And so the, the, the stress and the weight and the burden of performance and obedience sadly rests on the shoulders of those who think they have to keep that law in order to make and keep God happy with them and earn his favor and his blessings and all this other nonsense. So, um, so Paul goes on here, and this is, the, this is the issue that was going on in the Galatian church. They began in the Spirit. Through Paul's ministry, they were introduced to a resurrected Christ. Um, the Spirit moved mightily and powerfully um, in their gatherings, and they started off on the right foot. They began in the Spirit. It wasn't some long, lengthy, drawn-out process. He even wrote to them in um, Galatians 3. He said, you began in the Spirit. He said, how is it now that you think that you're made perfect by the flesh, made perfect by your effort, made perfect by your thinking that you have to, you know, perform and observe to do everything written in the law? And um, so he says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And um, this was the case in the book of the Revelation. The seven churches all began in grace. And, you know, Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, I believe it's about the 15th verse, and Paul wrote to Timothy and he said, all those who are in Asia have forsaken me. All seven churches in the Revelation were in Asia. They all forsook grace by adding back on top of it the keeping of the law. And once just a little bit is added back into the mix, man, does it puff up and make people proud and arrogant. Self-righteousness really is the result. And you look down your nose on everyone who is not living the way you are or observing, quote-unquote, the Word of God the way that you are. And, you know, the, 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 the sad thing is that, you know, People assume under the law there's 10 commandments to keep, but there are not. There are a total of 613 commandments, judgments, ordinances, and statutes. And um, you got to do it all in order to make and keep yourself right with God under the law. And what people who try to practice all of that don't realize is that the law was really a bunch of types and shadows, proverbs, parables, and dark sayings that actually pointed to the person and finished work of Jesus Christ in his glorious cross. The law had nothing to do with being a honeydew list that we had to observe or else. It actually all pointed to the person and finished work of Christ. And that is why on the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him, um, and he prayed, it says the... the um, the fashion of his countenance was altered. And he began to glow and radiate with the glory of God, and Moses and Elijah appeared. Well, where did they come from? Well, they stepped out of his body, because he was the Word, he was the Law and the Prophets made flesh. 
And it was interesting, <clears throat> and this was before Calvary. Um, so everything before Calvary is really technically Old Testament. So what did Moses and Elijah, the Law and the Prophets, speak to Jesus about? His death that he should accomplish at Jerusalem. The, the finished work that he was going to perform at Calvary. And so if we don't have a clear, accurate understanding how all the scripture in the Old Testament relates to the cross, and if we can't see the cross, uh, in some way, shape, or form in the middle of every uh, scripture in the Old Testament, then we really don't know what we think we do. Because Moses and Elijah spoke of Christ. The Law and the Prophets spoke of Christ. But I digress. In the, church, the Galatian church, as I said before, they began in the Spirit, and then there were some individuals who came along and said, well, you know, you began in the Spirit, there are manifestations of the Spirit happening, but you still must be circumcised. They bring back, again, one issue of the law. And they make that into everything. They turn it, one, one part, they turn it into everything. And so Paul goes on and he says, I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubles you shall bear his judgment whosoever he be. The irony is that those who insist that other people still keep the law, they don't even realize how much judgment and condemnation they themselves are still under. And they think that judgment and condemnation is actually the liberty of the Spirit, and that's really sad. He goes on in verse 11, he says, And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, if I yet preach the law, the observation of the dead letter, why do I yet suffer persecution? So, you know, all of Paul's persecution came from those who insisted on keeping the dead letter of Scripture. And so it is today. It's, it's the exact same thing today. Paul says, Why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. The cross of Jesus Christ is highly offensive to self-righteousness. The cross of Jesus Christ is highly offensive to anyone who thinks that they can obey the word of God to make and keep themselves right with God. If your believing and my believing, if our obedience and performance is enough to make and keep ourselves right with God, boys and girls, then why did Jesus come and go to the cross in the first place? Verse 12, Paul says, now he gets a little extreme here, and King James translators cleaned up the language a little bit, but I will, I will do my, my obligatory part in filling you in on the blank spaces. Um, he, says, if I, <laughs> he says, if I preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. He said, I would they were even cut off which trouble you. Or in other words, what he's saying, and you can study this out in the Greek, and that is, if you think that a little cutting away of the flesh of the foreskin makes and keeps you right with God, why not go all in and just amputate the whole privy member? But then again, you're going to have something whereof you can boast, and of course you'll because you've maimed yourself, of course, probably carry around the pride and arrogance of a martyr syndrome and how you're suffering for God and how you did it for Jesus and all of this self-abasement stuff that people put so much value on anymore. And, um, and yeah, Paul said, if, you know, your effort at cutting away your flesh, your effort at, you know, a little, a little cut around the, the foreskin, uh, you think that makes you right with God? Well, just go all for it, man. I mean, go in haul hog. Why stop there? Just cut off the whole thing. And then, of course, from the men, it gets really quiet. <laughs> oh, boy. Verse 13, Paul says, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Uh, and in particular, 
one aspect of that is liberty from the law. Another major aspect of that is the liberty and the freedom to move in the demonstration of the Spirit. For brethren, you have been called unto liberty, and here is the punchline, more or less. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. And here's the kicker, but by love serve one another. So here's the thing about so much of what I am hearing anymore regarding grace, is that grace is freedom from bondage to the law, which it is, um, but it stops a little short regarding what the apostles wrote to the churches. See, grace is freedom not only from the law, grace is freedom from sin. And sin, in its simplest form, is selfishness. So grace does not enable me to live in freedom to just completely serve myself and do whatever I want. I've heard like some people say, you know, you know, just love God and do whatever. Just love God and do whatever. And I have to stop and ask, especially based on how people are treating one another today. And this rampant view of, of, of even Christians saying, well, I have God, I don't need you. Yeah, that wasn't Jesus' uh, attitude on the cross when he died for us all. He never, he never came across with the attitude nor copped an attitude that said, I have God, I don't need you. Um, so my question is, if we're free to just love God and do whatever, then where does our brother figure into that? Where, where does one another, where do, where do we actually fit into our lives with one another regarding that attitude? I have God, I don't need you. Um, just love God and do whatever. Where's the care and where is the love for one another then? Um, in, in the parable of the two prodigal sons, the father never told. The father never told the younger prodigal or the older prodigal to love God and do whatever. Um, in fact, if you're willing to receive it, it was actually the father reaching out through the younger prodigal to the older prodigal. And it was the older prodigal who was self-righteous. Kept his little journal and notebook of all of the sweet nothings that God whispered into his ear about what he had to do versus what he didn't have to do. And yet, never the fatted calf. Yet, never got a true foundation in his actual identity in the Father's eyes. And from his self-righteous point of view, had absolutely no need of his brother in his own estimation. So this is where, in general, this is the stumbling block where we're still spinning our wheels in Pentecost and we have not yet transitioned into the manifestation of tabernacles. Because you see, in the manifestation of tabernacles, we've gone beyond emphasizing signs, wonders, healings, miracles, revivals, and moves of the Spirit. And we've actually... Now, there's going to be plenty of signs, wonders, healings, miracles, moves of God, all that stuff in tabernacles. But in tabernacles, we are actually going to return to the root and source of it all, and that is our Father's love in our hearts toward one another. It's beyond love God and do whatever. It's allowing that same love that hung on the cross in the body of Christ to tabernacle in our hearts toward one another. While we're on that note, too, if you hold your place in Galatians 5, you go over to 1 Peter. <clears throat> First Peter. Oh, uh, let's just look at one verse here. Uh, 
Well, actually, let's look at a few. Um, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. It says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as uh, silver and gold, from your vain conversation or your vain lifestyle, that's a self-seeking, self-serving, self-pleasing lifestyle, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. We've been redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead, and gave him glory. Now watch this. That your faith and hope might be in God, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying. That word obeying in the Greek is actually believing. Let me read those two verses again, because they're not always linked together, and that's sad because it diminishes the context who by him do believe in God. We're going to talk about that in a second. What is the true source of believing? Do I believe in order to get saved so that I can then boast about my faith? Or do I get a revelation of the Lamb that he actually saved me all by himself and thereby that revelation triggers within me a believing heart. And see, then I have nothing to boast or brag about. Because now my faith or believing is the byproduct of a revelation of what Christ did for me. Versus my thinking that I have to work up faith to believe in order to get saved. Big difference. One, the cart follows the horse. The other, the cart is before the horse. Most of Christianity today is the cart before the horse. So again, it says, by him, who by him you do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God, seeing you have purified your souls in believing the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. Wait a minute. When I capture the revelation of Christ, the truth of who he is and what he's done for me through the Spirit, the result is that I should have an unfeigned, an, meaning not a pretend love, not a fake love, toward my brethren? You mean the result of coming to terms with the revelation of the Father's love for me in and through the Lamb, results in my actually desiring to love my brethren with unfeigned love, unfake love, unpretend love? Yeah. If I get a revelation of His love for me and how much the Father loves me and how, He has included us all in the body of Christ, all in the body of the Lamb on the cross. And I realize that the same love that he has for me, he has for the whole world. Then how could I ever come off with the attitude of I have God and I don't need you? How could I ever live with the mentality of just love God and do whatever without any regard for anyone else? So just love God and do whatever despite what my wife thinks? I don't know, you can talk to her, but I don't think that's going to fly. Seeing you have purified your souls in believing the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love. That means genuine love of the brethren. Then he goes on and he says, See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. See that you love one another with a pure heart, pure motive, no ulterior motive or hidden agenda. And not only that, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. 
Where's that happening today? Believers loving one another with a pure heart fervently? No, we're still worshiping signs and wonders and healings and miracles and moves of God and gifts of the Holy Ghost and angels farting gold dust. Because we want to be entertained like little children. And we haven't grown up in the Father's love. And that's why the gifts of the Spirit have waned to the degree that they have. See, here's another scripture that I think is really apropos in this study today. 1 Corinthians 14, if we go there. Um, again, card before the horse. Um, let's see here. 1 Corinthians 14. Paul writes, verse 1, 1 Corinthians 14, he says, Follow after charity or love. In other words, be led by love. Another way you can say that, be led of the Spirit. And desire spiritual gifts. We're going to say it again. Follow after love. Follow after charity. The King James says, you can say it this way. Follow after the Spirit. Be led of the Spirit. Be led of love. And desire spiritual gifts. The harlot church follows after spiritual gifts. The, the, the harlot church covets and runs after spiritual gifts. The harlot church runs and covets after signs, wonders, healings, miracles, you name it, moves of God, gifts of the Spirit. And, it, and they want the harlot church not only uh, follows after and tries to chase the gifts, but actually expects worship, adoration, and love for those gifts operating through her. We're going to talk about the cart before the horse. So when, when, when that loving one another with a pure heart fervently is no longer in play, and we actually despise one another, hate one another, which, in all honesty, hatred is the root of murder. If you hate your brother, you mind it. I mean, it's, it's the, it's, it's, it, it, hatred in the heart is really, um, the Lord looks at it as murder. And you might not physically kill your brother or sister, but you'll write them right out of their life, your, your life. I mean, just you'll cut them off. And Jesus even said, he said, you know, the time comes when, you know, they'll throw you out of the synagogues. And, you know, whoever, whoever kills you will think that he's doing God a service. That's not just talking about physically putting people to death. It's just you just write people right out of your life, even for telling you the truth, even for being truthful and honest with us. So like what Peter said, he goes, you know, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. How are we supposed to do that with this ongoing identity crisis and our constant pursuit after the entertainment value of signs, wonders, healings, miracles, and moves of God? Paul didn't say that. He didn't say chase after the gifts. He said pursue after love, follow after love, be led of the Spirit. Let love be your inspiration and as you do that, just desire the gifts of the Spirit to flow through you. And then they see the gifts of the Spirit, they have, they have their proper foundation, the Father's love toward people. And you actually want to pray for people and see people get touched by the power of God, not to draw attention to yourself, your ministry, or build a church, but because you actually care for the people. Who would have thought? So, um, see that we love one another with a pure heart fervently, because that is really, if we go back to Galatians now, that is really where we shift over into the Feast of Tabernacles. I don't have the time to get into this today, but, you know, in, I believe it's Matthew chapter 7, you know, Jesus talked about a group of people. He said in that day, he said, there will many, there'll be many that say unto me, he said, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and cast out devils in your name and done many mighty works in your name? And he's going to say to them, I never knew you. I never knew you. Because you see, those gifts operate through the Spirit. They're gifts. You can't earn them. You can only open yourself to them. But if at any point in time we start to take those gifts and turn them to serve ourselves in our ministries and to build our own church, that's really not what Jesus was after in the Gospels. As far as I can remember, how about, what do you think? What are your thoughts? 
It's like, I never knew you. You, you took the gifts and you, you, you twisted and perverted them, just like they do the scriptures. You know, to justify a point of view they have already made up in their mind. Um, never humble, never humble, blah, 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 humble, teachable. And just wanting to know the Father out of the sheer joy of knowing his heart. Just for the sheer joy of knowing him. There's always this, like, these strings attached. Ulterior motives, hidden agendas. And um, how we can kind of twist this in a way to serve us and build for ourselves our own kingdom that bears our own name, which, by the way, is the name of blasphemy, which we'll also talk about in the book of the Revelation. Self-righteousness only has one name written across its seven ugly heads, its own. And that doesn't, and that can be, you know, on a personal level, that could be our own name. On a denominational level, definitely the name of your own denomination and its twisted spin on things, where it's just scouring the scriptures to find something out of context that it can justify a point of view that it has already decided is true, but it doesn't line up with the nature of the Father and the Lamb. So, um, anyway... See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Paul said it this way. He said, um, Brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only don't use liberty for an occasion to the flesh. In other words, this liberty that grace has given you, this freedom that the Father's love has imparted to you, don't take it, twist it, and use it to serve yourself. But by love, serve one Another. I'll give you another scripture that ties in with this. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's go over there quickly. I mean, by the way, since we're even talking about it, you know, the book of the Revelation, look at how men and women have twisted the meaning of that book. I mean, to terrify people, um, to manipulate and coerce them into building some end time events ministry or program that they're trying to erect that will show people the way of salvation. Let me save you the time and trouble. His name is Jesus. He is the way. He is not only the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. Already been done. Don't need to do it again. Get more focused on heralding the right message instead of trying to use Jesus like so many have done in the past to magnify themselves, build themselves a name build themselves a ministry, build themselves a church. It's all been done before and it's boring. And honestly, that's why we're in the predicament that we are around the world. At Harlot Church, she has been the greatest of all false prophets. She is the false prophet in the book of the Revelation. She does not have the light of salvation, and she's still trying to convince men to this day that there is something they need to do to get saved. We'll talk about this more reason why I've suffered and my wife has suffered the way that we have all these years. But I am going to keep plugging as long as there is breath in these lungs. I'm going to smile at you lovely people and keep opening my mouth and share with you, sharing with you what the Lord has put on my heart. There are others who have gone before me who have suffered much worse than I have. I tip my hat to them. Um, check this out. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul says this, this again ties into love one another with a pure heart fervently, which Peter wrote. He also, um, you know, wrote Galatians 5.13, Brethren, you have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. Don't use this grace, don't use this freedom that divine love has given you through Christ to, as an opportunity to serve yourself, but by love serve one another. Follow after love and desire spiritual gifts so that you're actually a blessing to one another. Paul says, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14, For the love of Christ constrains us, because we thus judge. To this day, we still don't have this judgment. That if one man died for all, a correct rendering would be that if one man died as all, we have such a high priest who became us, it says in Hebrews, that if one man died as all, then were all men dead when that one man died. The mystery of the Old Testament sacrifice for sin and the laying on of hands and how 
when the hands were laid on the sacrifice and the sins were confessed, the animal that was sacrificed became one and the same as the offerer in the sight of God. We still don't get it. We think Jesus just died for us, but he didn't. He became us and he died as us. Hmm. One of the great mysteries of the cross. Hmm. And should you be graced and blessed by the Spirit to comprehend and see that, that sight you will not only notice after the smoke cleared and the dust settled and after the veil had been rent from top to bottom, that it was not just Jesus hanging on that cross, it was you. You'll witness your own dead corpse, and if you hang out there long enough and don't get the heebie-jeebies scared straight out of you, if you look intently, you will see your next-door neighbors hanging on that cross, people you love, people you like, and people you hate hanging on that cross, as their forms and visages will all appear in the land as he absorbed the entire Adamic race in himself and all of our sin and sins. My God. no going back from me. Once you see it, you're done. John said, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Your life's over. But man, what a life you get in exchange. Woo! I'm preaching myself happy. Thank you. So he says that if one man died as all, then when that one man died, all men were dead. And that he died for, or as all, verse 15, that they which live, here we go, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. Another way we can say that, love one another with a pure heart fervently. Another way we can say that, Galatians 5, verse 13, you have been called unto liberty, only don't use your liberty as an occasion and an opportunity to serve yourself. But by love, serve one another. 2 Corinthians 5 says that he died as all, that they which now live should no longer live unto themselves in the egotism and selfishness of their own narcissism, but unto him which died for them or as them and rose again. Grace is not freedom and liberty to us to continue in the lifestyle, the vain lifestyle we were living before we captured the revelation of it. That's not grace. I'm going to say that again. Grace is not freedom and liberty for us to continue living the vain lifestyle, the shallow, superficial lifestyle that we were living before we captured the light of grace by the Spirit. Grace is actually freedom from that vanity. And in all honesty, grace is freedom and deliverance from ourselves because whether we want to admit it or not, our biggest problem in this life is us. Our prejudices, our bigotries, our points of view, our unwillingness to open our hearts and minds to receive a different point of view, um, our care and concern and love for nothing but money and materialism, and this twisted idea and concept of I have God and I don't need you. And that's just not true. In fact, it's borderline downright blasphemy. Because if I'm made in the likeness and image of God, and so are you, how can I have God and not need you when we're his likeness and image? It's just... I'm afraid that our cell phones and, our, and our, our stupid computers and all of the video games and fiction and fantasy filled movies that we've watched over the years have so made us callous in our hearts and minds toward one another. You know, the world only teaches us to become suspicious of one another and to, to judge and to hate. And then it wants to make fun of us when it no longer has a need for us. And um, it's sad that you know, we're not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And the sad fact of the matter is, is so, so much of Christianity today is nothing more than conformity to the world. And we, we're so callous to it now. We, uh, it's like the nerve endings have been singed and we can't even feel the difference. But 
I don't want to be a doomer and gloomer, but I do got to share what what's what. So um, if you go back to Galatians here, we're actually going to finish this today. So one more time, verse 13, for brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only do not use your liberty as an occasion to the flesh. Don't use it as an opportunity to serve yourself, love God, and do whatever. Excuse me, but by love serve one another. Now check this out. Another cart before the horse issue. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, here's the cart before the horse. The natural mind or carnal mind reads this scripture and says, Oh, because I love my brother, I have fulfilled the law. And see, you still need to fulfill the law, John. That's the cart before the horse. But while we're on the subject, let me review something we, we looked at in our study of Romans chapter 10. So, Hold your place, Galatians 5. We're not going to go to Romans 2 just yet, but Romans 10. We did a long study on the exposition of Romans chapter 10, which would be good for some of you who have never, who have never watched that series. Go back and check it out. It's still posted in our YouTube videos, an exposition of Romans chapter 10. It's really quite different. Um, but Romans chapter 10, let's look at this thing here that Paul alludes to in Galatians 5, where he says, All the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So I'm going to give you a spoiler alert. Just because you love your neighbor does not mean you've fulfilled the law. But brother, that's what the Bible says. That's what we think it says. Watch. Romans 10, verse 1. Paul's prayer for natural Israel. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. From what, you might ask? For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Ever met the people who are very zealous and excited about the idea and concept of God and the things of God, but yet there's, some, there's an ignorance, there, there's a lack of knowledge somewhere, and what Paul points out, verse 3, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness. Now we talked about what that is, and God's righteousness is the Father's love manifested in and through the Lamb. The Father's love manifested and seen in and through the Lamb, as the Father is only seen in and through the Lamb. The Lamb, Jesus Christ, only ever portrayed and expressed one true image of the Father, and that was a Lamb. And in the end, the only person's image of God and image of the Father that's going to matter is the lambs. Abraham told Isaac, my son, God shall provide himself as the lamb. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, they being ignorant of the Father's love in the lamb, and going about to establish their own righteousness, they have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God because in order to submit yourself to the righteousness of God, in order to submit yourself to the love of the Father, you have to have a revelation of it. Once the eyes of your heart comprehend it and that light enters your heart and you see it, it fills you to overflowing with the same love that hung in the body of Christ on the cross and loved you and I in that way. So they're ignorant of God's righteousness, and as a result, when we're ignorant of the Father's love, we're ignorant of the mystery of our inclusion in the body of Christ and His sacrifice. We are, we're, If we're ignorant of the Father's unconditional and all-inclusive love, you say, oh, brother, are you one of those inclusionists who believe that, that everybody got saved? I, actually, they did, because I know everyone died on that tree, and I've seen it. I don't really care if people don't believe me, and I never get invited to another Christian conference again. I could not give a flying crap. But if you see that, that every person was included, that's what Jesus talked about. He said, 
He said, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, perfect in Matthew chapter 5. And in that context, he was talking about actually loving your enemies, loving and blessing those who hate you and use you and uh, uh, persecute you and despitefully use you. That word perfect is the Greek word teleos, and it comes from the word circle, the idea of a circle, that God has excluded no one outside of the circle of his love. So yes, I do believe all men were included because I saw them all die on that tree. I saw it. I saw myself dead, my neighbors dead. Some of you out there I haven't even met yet. I've seen your faces. I just don't officially, formally know you. You hung on that cross in the Lamb. There is no more sacrifice for sins. One man's sacrifice took care of our sin and sins for all time. And if you're listening to anyone who tells you differently... I would suggest not listening anymore. Even if you don't believe me, that's fine. Turn me off, but at least do yourself a favor and go pick up your New Testament from Romans through the book of Jude and meditate on it for about seven to ten years. And you will think in your mind, oh my God, I cannot believe the crap I've been listening to in church. Trust me, it will blow your mind. <laughs> For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, natural Israel going about to establish their own righteousness. And what were they using? What was natural Israel trying to use to make and keep themselves right with God? Let's keep reading. They have not submitted themselves under the righteousness of God. Again, because in order to submit yourself to the righteousness of God, let me say it to you this way. In order to believe in the Father's love for you, the eyes of your heart have to actually comprehend the Father's love toward you in and through the Lamb. And if you don't have that revelation, by default, it's not really a fault of your own. You just don't know. You're just ignorant of it. By default, however, you will attempt to go about establishing your own righteousness. Your own way, method, and means of making and keeping yourself right with God. Verse 4, it says, for Christ is the end of the law. See, Israel was trying to use the law, their obedience to and performance of the dead letter of Scripture. Much like the church does today, got to do what the Word says. Or else what? He's not going to love me? Well, he loves you unconditionally, but there's that but again, that big but of yours, you need to just get it out of the way. Because you can't say he loves people unconditionally and all-inclusively and then add a but to that. Because all it proves is our ignorance regarding what truly happened at Calvary. Well, brother, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Um, did you ever read the Old Testament? Well, it's funny how people boast in the law, but they've never actually read the law. Because in the Old Testament tabernacle, there was only one throne. There was only one seat upon which God sat. And in Hebrews, you can read about this in great detail. It was called the mercy seat. The New Testament calls it now the throne of grace. So, <laughs> yeah, we are going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ because when we appear before that mercy seat and we stand before that throne of grace... And we find out that it's not just him sitting on it, it's us included in him. Then there's going to be judgment rendered, judgment imparted, which is actually discernment, where we are finally going to be able to see through all the crap that Christianity has tried to perpetrate on us. And we will finally receive judgment. It says in Daniel, judgment was given unto them. And they discern the difference between dead letter versus spirit. They discern the difference between old creation versus new creation. They discern the difference between old covenant versus new covenant. They discern the difference between law versus grace. Judgment was given unto them. Yes, I love judgment because it makes me sharp as a two-edged sword and I can pierce to the dividing asunder of dead letter versus spirit. I can pierce to the dividing asunder 
because that judgment has been imparted to me by the Spirit. I can see the difference between the books that are opened and that judge us according to our works versus that other little book that is open called the Book of Life. I can see the difference. There weren't two separate thrones or two, two separate seats in that Old Testament tabernacle. There was one. And the judgment seat of Christ, my friend, my brother, my sister, even if you hate and despise me, I really, it's all right. You can kill me if you want. If that makes you happy, I win. There's only one seat. There's only one throne. It is a judgment seat. But it is to be specific and keeping everything in context. It's the mercy seat. It's the throne of grace. I love the judgment seat of Christ. Wow. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. But, so the Jew was, the natural Jew was trying to use the law to establish their own righteousness, just like the modern church is still insisting that we keep the dead letter of Scripture in order to make and keep ourselves right with God, earn blessings and favor from Him. And every denomination, regardless of the name, is full of their own opinions about this stuff. But they lack a revelation of God's righteousness. They don't comprehend the Father's love as he is seen in the Lamb. Now, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. Again, here's another cart before the horse scripture, but follow my madness. I don't believe in order to get saved. When the light bulb clicks on in my heart through hearing the actual pure gospel, and my heart comprehends the fact that Jesus himself, apart from my help, apart from my sinner's prayer, apart from my water dunking, apart from my having to, quote, join a church, which I think that's funny, apart from anything that I have been told my entire life I have to do, Jesus himself saved me all by himself. Salvation is not the resulting of any, uh, result of anything that John can do. Salvation is a person who has included us all in himself, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30, it is of God the Father that you are in Christ Jesus. You had nothing to do with it, and neither did I. It is of God that you are in Christ Jesus, who of God has been made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. My right standing with God is not based on what I do or don't do. My right standing with God is based on a person. And he not only put me in right standing with God, he has bonded and fused me together with a trinity themselves. I didn't earn it. I can't lose it because it's not based on works. What do you mean, brother? You mean you are you one of those type who believe that you cannot lose your salvation? Well, if your good performance didn't earn it for you, what you perceive as something that can disqualify you from it is your own error. We still don't have this right. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. So the reason I believe is because at some point I came into the knowledge of the true gospel. I comprehended that his death was my death. I comprehended that his burial was my burial. See, no need to put myself through a second death because that hurts. That's what the Revelation says. I'm not trying to achieve a second death. I've just awakened, I've, 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 I have awakened to the revelation of my death in him. And because the eyes of my heart by the Spirit have comprehended that, his, the Spirit caused me to comprehend the fact that he is my salvation. Jesus' name means God himself is my salvation. And he's already saved me. And when my, the eyes of my heart see that, that love that I see, triggers, inspires, imparts, raises up, agitates, stirs up faith, I have no choice but to believe. I'd be stupid if I didn't. In fact, I can't not believe. I tried. I've tried many times, but nothing has ever stopped me from believing in his love. But 
it was a revelation of that love that facilitated my believing. So my believing is the effortless byproduct of a revelation that I've comprehended. My believing is an effortless byproduct of a revelation that the Spirit enabled me to capture. I believe not to get saved. <laughs> I believe because the Spirit caused me to find out that I am saved. And I believe. So Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. The, that word end also means it's the point of termination, the conclusion, um, the, uh, the fulfillment. He's the, he's the fulfillment of it because it all pointed to him. And since he did the job flawlessly, and the Spirit has caused me to comprehend that, I believe there's nothing more that I need to do to make and keep myself right with God. I don't need to pray a sinner's prayer. I don't need to believe or else. If you don't believe, you're going to hell. Now faith has become a threat. And now, and now i got to work up faith and be sure that I do, or else I'm going to be thrown into some sort of fire. Don't you love the timing of all this, how stuff works? Um, and so now faith has become works, if, if I think that way. Whereas faith is actually the result of a divine inspiration that hits me like a ton of bricks by the Spirit. Hey honey, just finishing up a video. Everything's hitting at once. He's barking, going crazy. It's great. It's timing. So this last verse, in verse 14, all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I'm not loving my neighbor in order to fulfill the law. The fact of the matter is, is if I have the revelation that Christ himself is the end of the law, he's the fulfillment of it, and he included me in his death, and I become aware of the love that was shown toward me in Christ, in his inclusion, not only of me, but the whole world. See, once I get that revelation by the Spirit, now I'm not trying to love my brother to fulfill the law. I am loving my brother because in my heart I possess the revelation that Christ fulfilled the law. Christ is the end, the fulfillment of the law to everyone that believes. If they don't truly believe in the sense of the word that I've just described, if they're trying to use faith to work up salvation or believe or else, the irony is they really don't have a revelation of the cross. They're still thinking that they got to do something, even believe, even pray a sinner's prayer in order to get saved. And that's just not true. That's been perpetrated and pushed on so many people. And then, of course, the people who lead you in the sinner's prayer got to bring you as a trophy to their church and parade you around and say, look who I led to God. That's yeah, just all sick and twisted. So all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And now we're talking about the Feast of Tabernacles. Remember the father came out and begged the older prodigal to come into the tent. He actually met him at the Lake of Fire is where he met him, at the brazen labor at the brazen sea. Because the father's heart is for his sons to come together and fellowship in his presence around the lamb. This is not about going to church, but it is about finding like-minded people who have set their affection on things above, who value the lamb more than sports, politics, arts, music, entertainment, all of that stuff. It's about, it's about being around a body of people in the midst of which is the Lamb, the revelation of the Father's love, and that finished work, and the mystery of the world's inclusion, and that final sacrifice for sin. Oh, it is about that. It is about that. But it is not about building buildings with bigger steeples, and more stained glass windows, and more plush carpets, more kitty programs, and things to sign up and get involved in. It is not about that. That's for sure. So once we comprehend that love, that fulfilled the law, we will be free to love one another with a pure heart fervently because the love that hung on that cross is the inspiration behind it. 
So we'll talk more about this next time. Hope it was a blessing. Sorry about the barking. Have a great rest of your day. See you in the next video.